to another of my piano side chats. Today I thought I'd talk a little bit about the Robert Parsons Ave Maria, which we've been rehearsing and sounds really good actually down in the space where you have a nice resident acoustic, which is a bit like a, an ecclesiastical building, one of the medieval cathedrals or something. Uh, Robert Parsons, probably a name not familiar to most of you before we started doing this. He was uh, <coughs> 1535, roughly speaking, although not absolutely sure, to 1572, where unfortunately he drowned in the River Trent, which was a great shame. So he was definitely cut off in his youth. Um, now he was, in, he was writing, composing at a period of extraordinary upheaval, of course, in Britain. This is the Tudor century, and if you've been reading Hilary Mantle over the course of uh, lockdown, uh, or indeed you just know your Tudor history, you'll know that the Tudor, the middle of the Tudor century, was the time when Henry VIII threw out the uh, Pope from any jurisdiction over England, and uh, therefore, although he wasn't really bothered about doctrine, changing the Catholic doctrine, set in train a series of events, which then ended up with when his son took over the throne, in uh, 47, Edward VI took over the throne and uh, although he was a young boy and was basically, uh, it was what they called a protectorate, so he was nominally in charge really, but that, that allowed the people in charge to make it very much a Protestant nation at that point. And then of course you had, in 53, you had Mary, Mary uh, Catherine of Aragon and Henry's daughter come back to the throne and create everything Catholic again. And then in 58, Elizabeth I, Henry's other daughter, uh, ascended to the throne and she took a sort of pragmatic approach. And that's kind of the beginning of the Anglican church where you get this sort of compromise between Catholicism and Protestantism and so typically English, somewhere in between, a bit of a compromise. Um, so, if you were a musician at that time, you had to be quite uh, deft and careful to be writing the right sort of music. Because, of course, if you veered clearly to one side or the other too much or at the wrong time, then you could be in trouble. Uh, what Parsons did was, uh, as indeed other people like William Byrd uh, did later, was write music both for Catholic and Protestant rites, as they call them, in the liturgy. And um, in my other choir, Excalabia, we have some of his, what they call his great service, or first service, which is a magnum nunc. In fact, it also has morning canticles as well in the set. Um, great service, meaning it's quite a sort of uh, extended sort of contrapuntal texture. So he did write in English, kind of even song setting in English, but then he also wrote about a, a dozen or so Latin motets, of which this is one, and of course Ave Maria, you can't get more Catholic and Roman than that. So, an interesting background, he was um, associated with, with the area of Lincoln, possibly taught William Byrd up at Lincoln Cathedral, um, 1563, he did become a gentleman of the Chapel Royal, as most of the uh, great musicians of the 16th, 17th centuries did. And uh, then and that's kind of like, obviously, the, something that they wanted to have. It's the sort of royal seal of approval if you've been accepted. So that's basically the background he's writing in. Um, his Ave Maria is a piece almost like no other in that while he's adopting inevitably the sort of early mid uh, 16th century style of flowing counterpoint it, it has a particular uh, feel to it the way he uses his lines it's very slow moving and there's a sort of what appears to be you might think is a cantus firmus i mean to kind of like a, a low a sort of long slung out tune in the soprano line because the soprano just comes in with that A flat and then comes in with a B flat with a few notes and then a couple of bars later comes in on a C 
just on a C, and then on the next line comes in on a D flat. That little phrase appears again, then comes in on an E flat. Just repeated notes, and then on the F. So that sort of helps it to feel that it's gently unfolding and building up, but according to the historians, it's not actually a catus firmus, it's just, it just kind of builds it up and comes in on a different note each time. Um, the other thing about the, the Shaver piece, of course, is it has this wonderful Amen at the end, and that's, that, that shows most clearly all the parts following one another as they all enter with this phrase, which is unusual because it's more based on fifths and fourths. Uh, here it is. <laughs> Soprano. So, and uh, it's kind of got that uh, very special um, kind of atmosphere created by these fifths. Um, the only other thing to say about this piece is that his handling of dissonance is so specific to the, what he does. He includes, perhaps more than most pieces of this period, this particular distance where you get the uh, And it makes it particular, very sort of very, very uh, like really gets to me. Here it is, like it right at the end of the piece. Here we go. And then the other thing he does at the end of the piece, which again he does several other places as well, you get the. suspension in the sense it's not a dissonance in actually clashing with something but it is a dissonance in because we expect to hear that but we're hearing that but it has to resolve it means you get for a moment you get a, what you kind of it feels like a sort of like a sixth chord an added sixth which makes it sound rather lush one of my all-time favorite pieces as you can tell, the little pieces we're doing this time are my favourite pieces, uh, but this one, it's just casts a, a wonderful sense of serenity and peace every time I've ever performed it with choirs, and um, I think we can do it with that for the moment, can't we? So uh, do listen to some of the suggestions I've made. I've put them. Uh, I'll put them on the on Facebook, but uh, there are there are several recordings around. Um, but this new choir, at least a choir new to me, called Signi Oro, uh, S-I-G-L-O, um, I'll write it down. Um, very young choir, my son Jonathan knew about them and knows several people in it, so they're all people probably in their 20s. And they sing it quite expansively, quite slowly, absolutely beautifully, and their Amen is fantastic. So do listen to that one as much as you can. But you've also got... Um, the 16 with Harry Christopher's doing a very professional job as well. And they take it a little bit faster, which I think for this particular piece to have that serenity, it's nice to make it a bit slower. So there we go. That'll probably do for today. Hope you enjoyed that. Do try and listen to it a few times and kind of absorb the feel of this piece and style. Because I've noticed when we've sung Tudor music, which some of you are more familiar than with than others. When we were saying those who are less familiar, I think you need to get into it a little bit, but once you get into it, you begin to realise where all the lines go. Everybody has their own tune because it's very contrapuntal. And I know that my, my summer choir, they just love singing this sort of music because everybody has an interesting part to sing. So that's probably it. Happy listening. Do try and uh, take it out of the copy. Take the copy, I mean, out of your folder and have a quick listen to it with the music in front of you. And uh, let's hope we'll meet again soon. Bye for now.